Welcome to Planet Sleep. I'm your host, Josh, and in tonight's episode, we're going to be visiting one of my most favorite places on the entire planet Earth. We're going to be visiting the beautiful and serene Great Barrier Reef, located off the coast of Australia. I had the opportunity to visit this place several years ago, and it was one of the most magical adventures I've ever had. So tonight, prepare yourself for the absolute peaceful, serene journey down under to the Great Barrier Reef. Before we go, I wanted to remind you that Planet Sleep is brought to you by my company, Higher Love Wellness. We just launched our tropical gummy blend, which contains the flavors of watermelon, mango, and pineapple. And they are so juicy and mouthwatering and provide the relief and relaxation you might be looking for. So check out Higher Love Wellness today at higherlovewellness.com. And all my listeners can save 10% on their entire order using code SLEEP at checkout. Again, that's HireLoveWellness.com for a wide range of different CBD hemp extract products, including topicals, tinctures, wax, and gummies. That's HireLoveWellness.com. Use code SLEEP for 10% off tonight. But now... I think it's time to embark on our journey to the Great Barrier Reef. Off the coast of Eastern Australia, a living wall of coral lines the continental shelf. Within this warm, shallow section of the sea, a sanctuary of ocean life lies just beneath the surface. The ocean waves lap at the side of the small diving boat in which you find yourself. A flag raised above the captain's chair waves the fury of the wind, and you prepare to plunge into this great sea. Clothed in a wetsuit and all, with a tank of oxygen strapped to your back, you are ready to see for yourself the natural wonders of the Great Barrier Reef. From above the water's surface, the reef is nothing more than a series of jagged lines, a blotch of colors, and smudges of an ocean floor. You sit at the side of the boat and check your waterproof watch, taking note of how long your oxygen will last underwater. Roughly 45 minutes, give or take, depending on your relaxed, controlled breathing Your heart rate settles, your breath steadies. The calmer you are, the longer you'll be able to remain underwater and swim along the endless reef. The captain waves goodbye as you tip your back off the side of the boat and plunge into the chilly waters of the Pacific. The clear waters cover the plane of your goggles and the air bubbles twist and turn slowly dissipating the deeper you fall into the ocean. The sunlight splinters through waves, and the bottom of the small boat rocks back and forth, like the belly of a giant turtle waiting for your return. You swim away from the surface. Down deeper is your goal. In fact, 400 feet below. The sound of gulls, the pelting wind, the waves that once lapped at the hole are far behind you. Now you hear only the breathing apparatus and the deafening expanse of the big blue ocean surrounding your small, chilling body. The bubbles of your breath leave your mouth and begin their journey with writhing trails back towards the surface. As clear as these waters are, 
not much can be seen below you. Aside from curving lines of the ocean floor, and the farther you distance yourself from the surface, the sunlight dampens as its rays redirect between the waterways. Shallow and warm were the descriptions you had been promised at the surface, yet all you see is a deep plunge into nowhere, and all you feel is the water growing colder the further you dive. In comparison to the rest of the ocean, perhaps, this Great Barrier Reef is shallow and warm, where others rest thousands of feet below the surface. All is matter of perspective. You take in a deep breath and dash towards the ocean floor, feeling the warmth of your body run to your fingertips. The redemption of your dive is not far below. The long, undulating lines of the reef slowly fade into view. They were always there, but undefined. A series of lines clouding the ocean floor, but now you see its distinction from the rest of the barren ocean. The Coral Sea. A small section of the Pacific barricaded by northeastern Australia, Papua New Guinea, and a string of islands to the east. Aside from the slew of lost Axes and Allies warships that riddle the small sections of its ocean floor, the Coral Sea is home to numerous reefs, including the world's largest reef, the Great Barrier Reef. Spanning over 1,200 miles along the coast of Australia, this broken wall of living coral snakes along the western Coral Sea. This reef was declared a World Heritage Site in 1981, and all previous oil exploration projects have ceased since 1975 in hopes of preserving its monumental contribution to ocean wildlife. In an ocean barren of nutrients, the reefs within the Coral Sea offer shelter and food to a plethora of wildlife. Where most of the ocean exists as an infinite pool of lifeless salt water, these reefs maintain resources and nutrients for an incredible amount of plants and animals. The Great Barrier Reef alone harbors 1,600 kinds of fish, 133 sharks and rays, and over 3,000 kinds of mollusks. Many of these creatures will live their entire lives within the reef and know nothing of the cold expanse beyond its coral borders. As you descend deeper into the waters, what was once a dead silence, only broken by your breathing apparatus, there now comes a constant crackling noise, like millions of corn kernels popping under intense heat, or the sizzling of bacon on a cast iron skillet. What you hear are the sounds of hundreds possibly thousands of crustaceans living within the coral reef. This is the sound they use to find their way home, back to the shelter they've made along with many others in and around this coral haven. Where light may fail the human eye within the depths of the ocean, down here, sound provides a wealth of information. Most of the sizzling and crackling you hear resonates from the snapping shrimp, also known as the pistol shrimp. These small one to two inch creatures hang around the coral reef and the ocean floor. At first, scientists believe the noise came from the shrimp simply snapping their pinchers together. But on closer inspection, the shrimp is actually forming a small bubble in a process known as cavitation. And when this bubble pops, it releases a surprisingly loud noise, and the heat inside the bubble can reach temperatures of up to 18,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This noise is so loud, in fact, that during World War II, submarines would use the crackling screen of sound as camouflage. With their use of sound, you might not be surprised to learn that these shrimp are almost completely blind. 
and this causes plenty of difficulty in an ocean filled with predators. They use the snapping to lure their loved ones home, yet they have no way of seeing the danger that may lurk just beyond their white picket fence. Because of this, the shrimp often form a relationship with the goby, a fellow neighbor of the coral reef. He's a small fish that sports two bug eyes on a large head connected to a tempered body. The deal struck between the two is fairly simple. The shrimp burrows into the sand and creates a home for both him and the goby, and in turn, the goby protects the shrimp. Before the shrimp leaves the burrow, he taps the goby on his shoulder to let him know he's leaving to find food and possibly a mate. The goby then keeps watch while his friend scours the ocean bottom, blind and hungry, and the goby floats perfectly still near their home. If he sees any danger, the goby moves just enough for the shrimp to sense his movement, and this is a signal to return home immediately. Above the Great Barrier Reef, you glide over the broad visage of winding coral walls. Far away enough to barely make out the intricacies of its ecosystem, yet close enough to hear the constant activity of even its smallest creatures. A painter's palette of all different colors speckles the wall of life, from brightest reds to darkest greens. A school of fish creates a moving, breathing cloud of action from one end of the wall to the other. Every bit of movement, every bit of life, seems to occur specifically at or around the reef, where its outer limits see much less traffic. Only those unwelcome, only those looking to strike the weaker creatures, drift at the outskirts. The shadow of a lone shark far beyond the wall paces back and forth. The small gang of barracuda circle the helmet of an old diving suit yards away from the vibrant colors of the reef. The large masses of coral appear alien in nature, some spongy and porous, others hard and mysterious. A limitless range of color decorates their exterior and their shapes vary in direction and size. Although there seems to be some cohesion to the madness, a museum of modern art rests before you, where small fishes glide past each exhibit. They see this coral as less of a spectacle. This is their day-to-day -day life, and this is their home. Here, the most diverse range of species within the ocean decides to congregate. Why here? In a boundless ocean whose depths continue to shroud themselves in mystery, why here at the colorful beams of the ocean have countless creatures come to reside? What does this habitat offer that others cannot? The answer lies within a 10,000 year history of an ever changing world. Over 10 millennia ago, the northeastern region of Australia, where the Great Barrier Reef exists today, was once a land covered in birds, land animals, and trees. The aboriginal people of Australia walked these lands, finding food and shelter along their path. During the last ice age, snow and glaciers covered the earth. The global temperature decreased dramatically and the aboriginal people of Australia struggled to survive. Forests began disappearing, animals vanished, and water sources either froze or disappeared entirely. The struggle to find sources of fresh water increased, and many of the aboriginal people perished at the hand of an unrelenting freeze. They abandoned roughly 80% of the entire continent and consolidated their numbers in locations where fresh water became available. When this era of extreme frost finally passed, as the earth warmed, the glaciers and snow melted away. The ocean levels immediately rose, and what existed as the land above sea level was no longer. 
This region of Northeast Australia fell underwater. Nearly one third of the entire continent of Australia sank beneath sea level. Its highest peaks remained, dotting the ocean with rigid islands, some large and some small. Over 900 dot the ocean where once was the land of Australia and the small fringes of the continental shelf that were left behind just off the new coast became an optimal place for coral to grow, a place of shallow waters and unrelenting sunlight. Coral is a living creature, a fact often easily forgotten. What looks like colorful leaves of foliage, small branches moving to the tide, or large clumps of knotted rock, and puckered bulbs of strange colors. This is how coral conceals itself along the reef. Coral are marine invertebrates that typically form together in colonies of polyps. Although they each have their own cylindrical bodies topped with a mouth surrounded by a small ring of stinging tentacles, each polyp of their colony is genetically identical and works together to form the reef. A natural representation of out of many, one. The coral will reproduce indefinitely and its offspring aren't necessarily offspring. They are rather duplications of themselves. These tiny polyps, typically no bigger than your pinky finger now, use their stinging tentacles to catch their prey. Once they digest, they release calcium carbonate, which is essentially rock, and this forms a hard skeleton around them. This calcium is what we often see when we look at the diverse shapes of the coral reef. Unfortunately, not many polyps can catch their sustenance this way. The salt waters of the ocean are often desolate and lack the nutrients required for these coral reefs to sustain themselves. Further, the tentacles of the coral are so small, its range of catching anything is minimal. So in an act of survival, some thousands of years ago, the desperate coral struck a deal with the algae that floated about the ocean waters. In an act of symbiosis, these microorganisms became intertwined with the survival of the coral reef. The algae found their way into the cells of the polyps, where they used photosynthesis to harvest energy from the sun. Now the coral no longer has to rely on catching the debris of drifting prey in order to survive. The coral, much like a plant, can receive its energy from the rays of the sun. So the shallow oceans along the coast of Australia provide a perfect place for coral to flourish. The symbiotic relationship between coral and algae has secured the survival of coral reefs for centuries. This relationship is also as fragile as it sounds. In the event of rising temperatures, which has become more common in light of global warming, there is a moment where the ocean waters become too warm and the relationship between coral and algae breaks. This is a process called bleaching. In warm waters, the coral will reject the algae living within its cells. And since the process of photosynthesis terminates, the coral will slowly begin losing its color. You float above the reef, weightless, as you reach the edge of a red piece of coral that reminds you of a borderless harp, you meet the edge of the neighborhood. The city block abruptly ends, there are no more fish, no more coral, and what was once a living coral reef filled with heavy traffic of different sized fish and colorful coral now sits barren at the bottom of the ocean. The vibrant painter's palette of the coral reef is now a blank sheet of calcium, the color of sand. As desolate as the desert, a ghost of its former self, a bed of rock and nothing more. Blocks of coral scatter the barren reef like rubble, debris clouds the water, and strewn about the vacant bed of rocks drifts the delicate remains of soft coral, colorless and abandoned like a tumbleweed 
across the dry desert. Behind you, the excitement of the big fish city disappears. The sounds, the skylights, the cab drivers honking their horns all fade in the distance. Urban blight has claimed this tract of reef. The waters were too warm and the cyclone storms were too fierce and they left behind only the calcium shells. Over the past several years, nearly 30% of the Great Barrier Reef has been affected by bleaching. The warmer temperatures along with cyclone storms off the coast of Australia have greatly affected the reef and its survival. The bustling activity of fish around the vibrant coral has vanished. Many reported that the reef has essentially been destroyed. But these claims are untrue. Much of the reef survived, and scientists are figuring out ways of protecting the reef from future bleaching events. There are two main forms of coral propagation used in hopes of returning the reef to its glory. In one method, scientists collect several specimens of coral and place them into nurseries they've built underwater. And once the coral grows to a suitable size, the scientists plant them back into the damaged sites of bleaching. Another method involves removing the coral from the ocean and planting them in raceways, which are artificial channels used to culture aquatic organisms. Once the coral has responded well and grown to a reasonable size, they are then returned to the ocean. The benefit of removing the coral specimens from the ocean is that in the event of another bleaching or cyclone storm, the coral within the raceways are protected artificially. And within these raceway tanks, they can be selectively bred in hopes that stronger offspring will be able to survive the impact of global warming in the future. After the first full moon in October, a massive breeding event happens in the reef. Millions of coral spawns are released into the ocean and travel along the gentle pathways until they find a potential home. Even the coral within captivity reacts the same way. They too release their spawns after the first full moon in October. Yet scientists can harvest their offspring and breed them selectively. The goal is to find a strain of coral that can withstand higher temperatures. And once they grow large enough, they are transplanted into the ocean. Although unnatural, these are often the most effective ways of combating the unprecedented effects of climate change. Hope remains for the return of the Great Barrier Reef to its former glory. The artificial revitalization of the reef is possible, the same way we've sheltered endangered animals and returned them to the wild in greater numbers. We may be able to save the Great Barrier Reef in a similar way. You finally pass the blight of dead coral and find yourself above a new wall of the reef. New shapes and colors coat the ocean floor and the fish have returned in greater numbers. Spiny blue coral pathways reach into the ocean. Star-shaped bristles grow within imperfect fractal shapes against the winding wall of the reef. Crustaceans peek from cover and the more skittish fish dash beneath the ridges of hard coral. A giant grouper fish strolls about the reef without fear, patiently waiting for the smaller fish to clean him of his blemishes of dead skin. With a face only a mother could love, the grouper looks terrifying with a massive body to match. But she is a highly social creature. Docile and kind, she comes to greet you Unafraid of your strange limbs and even stranger breathing apparatus, the grouper swims around you with a relaxed composure. A small cleaner fish dodges into her mouth where it plucks a bit of algae. Beside a bright limb of blue coral, swaying with the gentle motion of the tide, the soft tentacles of a giant bed of anemone flow to and fro. Each swaying polyp, translucent with a bright outline, alien-like yet gentle. If you were to touch its polyp, it would sting you. These sea anemones are close relatives of coral and jellyfish, and look as though the two creatures were fused together. As beautiful as a resting coral bed, and as dangerous as the sting of a jellyfish, 
The slightest touch triggers a harpoon-like filament into the victim and injects a paralyzing neurotoxin. If the anemone successfully catches its prey, its tentacles guide the creature into its mouth at the center of its body. Yet within its dangerous bed of tentacles pokes the head of a small clownfish, Marlin or Nemo perhaps. These fish survive the stinging anemone due to a coating of mucus on their bodies. The clownfish takes advantage of this and makes the bed of tentacles its home. Yet the transaction is mutual. As the clownfish removes unwanted parasites from the anemone, and the anemone lends shelter and protection to the clownfish. In the time of breeding, protection is crucial. As the female clownfish lays up to a thousand eggs, they lay them within a rock below the anemone and wait a week until they hatch. Only under the cover of night will the offspring make their way out into the ocean. With a gentle assistance from dad, they hatch and immediately live on their own. With hope they will find a protective bed of an enemy, just as their parents had, and their survival continues. As the clownfish leaves his anemone home, you follow him along the coral reef. He collects zooplankton and small bits of algae along his way. Within all the commotion of the reef, you lose sight of him within a swarm of fish moving in opposite directions. Below you, at the edge of the reef, you spot a curious looking starfish crawling along the ocean floor. Compared to your memory of a starfish, their tranquil presence along the sandy floor, this one appears not quite as friendly. Along its entire body and all of its arms, over a dozen in total tiny needles poke from its skin. Name the crown of thorns starfish for its identical look to the crown of thorns Jesus Christ wore. This starfish wreaks havoc on the coral reef. Its strange diet consists of coral, and in a time where the Great Barrier Reef is already threatened, as an unrelenting predator of the coral reef, this starfish can eat up to 117 square feet of coral per year. You watch as the starfish uses its prickly tentacles to climb the wall of coral. Once settled, it opens its mouth and releases a slew of enzymes that begins breaking down the coral tissue as they absorb its nutrients. As the starfish destroys the coral reef before you, not a predator in sight dares to stop it. The thorns that it wears are so strong and sharp that they easily pierce through a predator. More so, they release venom through their thorns which causes severe stinging pain in the victim's wound. Not much can be done as the starfish eats away at the beautiful, benevolent coral of the reef. In the past several decades, the crown of thorns starfish is the main culprit of the 40% loss of the coral cover on the Great Barrier Reef. And although coral can reproduce and once again populate the regions where others have been, there is an estimate of 4 to 12 million crown of thorns starfish in the ocean, and they release up to 50 million eggs per breeding cycle. They even have the ability to regenerate from small parts and can create multiple starfish from one single individual. When stabbed or harmed in any way, they also release sperm and eggs into the ocean. So by sheer numbers, the starfish might win the war. Luckily, there is one hero that might have a small chance at defending his home turf. In the tight spaces between the bodies of coral, between pink and white bulbs of calcium, a small crab has set up camp. He intends to live here for some time and didn't suspect an eviction on such short notice especially from an evil looking starfish whom he's never met before in his life. In fear of the prickly thorns of the starfish, the crab squeezes himself tight within the coral. He stands at the ready and armed with tiny pinchers that pale in comparison to the size of the starfish and his body of thorns. But he hopes that the slightest bit of annoyance will save his home. When the starfish stops moving and begins munching on the coral, 
the crab takes his brave yet meager pinchers and clips the belly of the beast with all of his might. A mere flesh wound, the crab can barely dig into the starfish. Yet by the slight retreat of the beast, his plan of bravery might work after all. The starfish rests his body over the coral once again, opening himself to another attack. Pinchers strike, in between the thorns carefully threading their way to the flesh of the starfish. He retreats yet again. Over and over, this continues until the starfish realizes his feast upon this coral is no longer worth it. There is of course plenty of other coral to terrorize. So the starfish slowly makes his retreat back towards the sandy ocean floor and looks for a different bit of coral, one without an angry tenant inside. The starfish has not been defeated, only deterred. The rate at which the starfish can breed, its impervious defense against predators, and the sheer amount of coral it eats make this little starfish the grim reaper of the Great Barrier Reef. And so, such a dangerous enemy to the reef requires an equally dangerous adversary to combat it. In the dark reaches of the ocean, beyond the coral wall, out where the lone sharks deal beside the barracuda, there swims another creature as deadly as the other bandits of the reef. Decorated in solid bright yellow and moving by five pivoting thrusters along its sides, a murder machine approaches you. The Cotsbot, yet another intervention of man in hopes to save the Great Barrier Reef. This autonomous underwater vehicle, equipped with computer vision and machine learning capabilities, patrols the reef in search of the Crown of Thorns starfish. Why does it search for them? Well, to eradicate them, of course. In its youth, the Cotsbot, trained by watching YouTube videos of the starfish on the move, and studied its operations across the reef. It learned to find and identify them, even in hiding places beneath coral ridges. The robot can identify the starfish with greater than 99% accuracy. Scientists also discovered that all it takes to kill a crown of thorns starfish is a direct injection of 20 milliliters of vinegar. So the Cotspot is equipped with an injector to take out its target once located. These autonomous robots alongside diving teams can take out up to 400,000 of these starfish per year. Diving teams are still needed to find the starfish in hard to reach locations, but the autonomous robots are so much more efficient. The benefits of using the robot over a diving team are the Cotspot can cover much larger areas and work eight hours a day, especially at night, while the starfish are most visible during their feeding hours. As the teamwork between machine and man continues in the Great Barrier Reef, its chance of survival improves by the day. And despite the unnatural approach when protecting the reef, its destruction would come at a much greater cost. More than a billion people depend on the survival of the reef for food and livelihood. As you float to the edge of the reef, you watch as the Cotspot approaches. Its camera eye swivels until it finds its target, the lone starfish that retreated from the crab and his mighty pinchers. Lonely and defeated, the starfish has seen his last day, and the bright yellow Cotspot hovers down to the floor and extends its injector arm past the thorns and into the starfish. Once its mission is complete, its arm retracts and swims away in search of another. The starfish withers, and its carapace becomes another bit of sustenance for the surrounding wildlife. A small price to pay in order to protect the Great Barrier Reef. You check your watch. Only a few minutes remain of your dive, and soon you must head back to the boat or risk being another bit of sustenance for the surrounding wildlife yourself. Again, you relax your breathing and your heart steadies. Weightless, you begin your ascent to the surface, yet not before the fortuitous meeting of souls congregate before you. 
Hulking shadows block the sunlight above you and move with the rhythm of dance. At first they look like a group of sharks, large, long, and powerful, but their docile nature says otherwise. As they come together, their interest is not the prey of the reef, but each other. Company is what they seek. The Great Barrier Reef is one of the only places where dwarf mink whales migrate. Although the exact reason is unknown, most suspect it is an ideal place for them to meet other mink whales and mate. This is the only place on earth to dive and swim with this species, and their friendly disposition allows them to come up and greet you without fear. The meeting of the whales is the last you see beneath the surface, and you slowly ascend alongside the air bubbles, and as the light breaks through the waves of water, you spot the underbelly of the diving boat puttering against the surface, breaking through the water, the sound of waves, the chirp of a gull, and the chug of a boat motor greet you. As the watery world and mystical coral fades, you exit one world and enter another. More familiar with its air and its sunlight, you breathe a deep breath of fresh air and remove your goggles. You climb onto the boat and tell the captain what you saw, but no explanation can ever truly capture the beauty of the reef. After only a few minutes out of the water, you already begin to miss the reed, the weightlessness of the ocean, the alien-like creatures of the depths, and you decide your journey is not over yet. On your way back to shore, you ask the captain to take you to a shallow bank of reef where the tide has gone out. There you watch the exposed coral show its endless shapes and colors to the world above. The low tide laps at the exposed rock, and in the crevice of a bank, you see fins slapping at the coral. A gray creature with black dots, no longer than three feet, muddles through the shallow banks of the reef. A rare sight to say the least. This is no fish, but an epaulette shark. Capable of severe oxygen depletion, this shark has no fear of shallow banks or partial land. It can divert its oxygen to its brain in order to survive, and can live for up to two hours without oxygen. It prefers moving along the ocean floor or on land by wriggling its body and pushing the floor with its paired fins. If you didn't know any better, it would seem that this shark is almost willing to live on land alongside us. But at your journey's end, you find yourself back on the beaches of Australia. Soft, spongy sand lines the endless beach. Sand that was once a part of the coral wall from where you have returned. Withered down to find particles. This sand once had color and shape, just like those of the reef. But over time, as all things, it has worn down and eroded into dust. The parrotfish of the ocean are known to chew on coral and spit it out or sometimes digest it, contributing to the erosion of coral and the beach of sand you now sit on, digging your hands into the pockets of cooler sand beneath the surface. Every bit of sand tells its own story of where it came from and how it got here, and each one together creates an infinite beach, a birthing ground where land meets sea. A group of turtles will hatch upon this beach tonight, and they will poke their heads from the hard shell of their mother's bearing. They will pull themselves from the chassis and shovel their way through the sand. They will know by the divine intervention of nature that they must make it to the sea. Although no one has taught them this, no one has shown them this. They know only by instinct. With their tiny fins, they will pull themselves through the dunes of sand towards the crashing waves of their future home, their salvation, the ocean, the Great Barrier Reef. Not all of them will make it, 
Many will perish on their journey from shell to surf. Some will be plucked by herons as they dart across the beach. Some will make it, yet even then they are not safe, as reef sharks lie in wait within the shallow waters, and from the moment they exit their shells, none are safe, yet some will survive. Some will make it beyond the heron, beyond the sharks, and live a full life beyond the wall of coral. They will plunge for food and rise for air. Some will not make it, yet enough will. Enough to maintain the survival of the species. To pass on another cycle of life to their progeny. As this is the hope gifted by the almighty Great Barrier Reef. That concludes tonight's episode of Planet Sleep. I hope you enjoyed your swim along the Great Barrier Reef. If you're still awake at the end, hopefully you learned a few things about this beautiful underwater ecosystem and what it needs in order to survive for future generations to enjoy. If you enjoyed this episode of Planet Sleep, I'd appreciate it. If you make sure you subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. But thank you for joining me on another journey to Planet Sleep. I hope you found some rest and some peace and quiet along the way. I'll see you next time in our next journey to Planet Sleep. Sleep easy, my friends. And good night.